What or who is the Holy Spirit? Let's talk about it. Welcome to The Pursuit, a Cross Point City Church podcast that pursues a deeper dive into the scripture from last week's sermon. I'm Lane Vrooman here with our lead pastor, James Griffin. Lane, good to have you back, bro. Glad to be back. It's been a minute. I know. How long has it been? Did you write the last day in your journal? I did, but you know what? <laughs> I, 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 I'd have to go back and reference, man. It's just, been a minute. It has been a minute, man. I always I was enjoy gonna, it when you're on. I was going to send you an email, but it's all good. I got an invite. Here so we are. Here, here we, we are. I, just, okay. I got a nice surprise. I thought I was getting a real good one, and I walked in, and here sits Lane Vrooman. So it's like Christmas morning? It was. I love. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So good. That's awesome. All right, listen. <laughs> So before we get started, I wanted to give a special shout out to our listeners in Easley, South Carolina. Did you know this? Easley is the home of the Senior League World Series. This is basically the next step up from the Little League World Series where kids aged from 13 to 16 from around the world compete for a title. All right, I got to be honest with you. So I read the stat earlier, Senior League World Series and the first thing that I thought about were like senior citizens. Me too. Okay, like I, I, so I'm glad for the the clarifying sentence Dude, after me that because all I could think about is like a bunch of 75 year olds running That's around I, out there playing I ball, know. which if that exists would be amazing, right? I I definitely watch it. I would watch it as well. I definitely watch. Yeah, it's I would, interesting. I would probably try to play in it. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, those are probably the <laughs> level of athletes that I could actually compete yeah. with at 36. Uh, so that's that's just my reality. But listen, here's something that's even crazier about Easley. In 1968, NASCAR driver Curtis Turner caused a telephone outage in Easley when he landed his airplane on the town's main street. Sounds like something a NASCAR driver would do. Yeah, I can't. Yeah. I mean, just imagine that picture. Like, <laughs> so many questions while at the same same time, like that, just left alone. Now, is, now, do you know if Curtis Turner is from Easley or lived in Easley? You don't know this. Do I you? don't know. It's okay, but he landed a plane there once and caused a telephone <laughs> outage. <laughs> That's pretty. That's incredible. kind of ball. Yeah, dude. it is. It I is, mean, if you've yeah. got an airplane, you might as well land it in the why not. Main Street of Why town. not? That's awesome. Way to go, Curtis. That a boy. Exactly. I love exactly. that. All right. So our friends in Easley, thank you so much for listening. Yeah. So this week we continued on in John 14. So can you give us a quick summary for anyone who might have missed your sermon? Yes, I would love to. So yeah, this weekend we talked about the Holy Spirit and I titled the sermon, Another Helper. This is what Jesus calls the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. in the text. And, you know, I just started by talking about some of my misconceptions growing up in the church. I, I mean, I just grew up in a church that never really talked much about the Holy Spirit. And mm. there were a lot of years of my Christian life where I was very confused about him, didn't understand my need for him. And we were talking before the podcast, yep. Lane, about the same being true for you, yes. but maybe in the other direction. Is yeah. that right? Yeah. All right. Talk about that for just a minute, dude. All right. So my family used to vacation in, in Blairsville, Georgia. So it's Union County. It's up about as far north as you can go in right. Georgia before you hit North Carolina. Yeah. And we had some friends that we would hang out with there and starting at like, man, I think it was like five or six years old. I would go into an Appalachian Okay. Spirit driven church. All right. <laughs> and dude, I cannot describe to you. Like being that young, you know, being in the church, you're still yeah. kind of figuring stuff out. Right, right, right. The things that I saw. Terrified? Terrifying. <laughs> were While there, also captivating, were, right? So were there snakes in this church? So there were no snakes, okay, but here right, but right. here's what there was. And this was always startling when it happened. But screaming, dude! Like yeah. so, like out of like preachers preaching, screaming, and primarily, I remember it's it's etched into my memory. It was an an older woman, and I mean, like by older, like dude. Yeah, older. she she was playing in the senior, yeah, Citizen League, World Series. That's exactly okay, right. All right. It, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It would be like senior, senior. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm not trying to dishonor, but the reality is, is I'm trying to paint a picture. She yeah. she was she was up there. Yeah. Scream. 
gets out of her seat, sp- splits running. <laughs> Literally around during the preaching. Yes. Okay. Up and down the aisle, around the aisle, and there was, and then of course, you know, you have tongues, you have, and I, I just, you know, you're in the pews and you're a child, and I just remember, you know, we had hard candies like lifesavers, and it was just like, what is going on? But here's the reality: every time I went back to Blairsville, yeah, just twice a year, Memorial Day, Labor Day, I'd go back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had friends. It was like, let's let's just check it out. Yeah. So, so that was so on the other uh, side. Yeah, right. So you can imagine the confusion, right, and, right, and, right, and all sorts of emotions yeah, is yeah. wrapped up in that. So that is well, that was okay. seriously some of my first exposure to the Holy Spirit. Well, and and you know to piggyback off your story, the people I grew up with, that's how they talked about the Holy Spirit. It's like, hey, let's uh, let's not get too carried away because we don't want to be the people that Lane Vrooman's hanging out with, you know? <laughs> I mean, and it would be a pretty fair right. caution. But, <laughs> but that's what caused this confusion in me. Yeah, yeah. And this is what caused so many misunderstandings in me. And, and it wasn't probably until my 20s that I really started to understand who the Holy Spirit is yep. and, and his purpose for being in my life. And so really a lot of the sermon yesterday was centered on that. And on Thursday, we just, we talked about who he is and we talked about what he does. And, you know, I just hit several points. I'm not going to re-preach the sermon, but we just talked about how he assures us of our, our salvation, mm-hmm. how he gives us spiritual life and vision. He unites us to both God, the father and God, the son, how he emp- empowers us to love and to obey Jesus. And, uh, and I also talked about how he teaches us. You know, Jesus says it in the text that part of his ministry is teaching us. And these are not new teachings. What he does is he makes sense of what Jesus taught. Right. And he brings to remembrance what Jesus taught so that we can obey. I, uh, I need to take a minute too and apologize to all of my 1115 AM Cartersville people because I totally left that point out of my sermon oh, yesterday God. as oh, I was man. preaching. Yeah, man. You know, it's crazy. Uh, a lot of weekends as I'm preaching, I'll, I'll add stuff in on the fly that mm-hmm. I just since the Lord wants me to say, it's very rare that I just leave something out that I've prepared to say, but it happened yesterday. So I didn't even realize it till after the, the morning was over. And I'm like, I totally didn't talk about that at 1115. So if you were there, I apologize. Uh, go watch the sermon because the one posted online is not that one. And you can hear what you've missed. But you know, all that to say this, the Christian life, and I said it in the sermon, is impossible without the Holy Spirit. That's right. We cannot follow Jesus apart from the Holy Spirit. And I even think about what you were describing in that church and and what that woman did in the moment of preaching. I think another thing to understand about the Holy Spirit is that he's always working to bring attention to Jesus, okay? J.I. Packer talks about how he has a spotlight ministry. Right. It's a brilliant illustration. Mm -hmm. If you're familiar with spotlighting, you know, you put lights on a house, not so that people look at the lights, but so that they look at the house. Mm. The, The purpose is not to draw attention to the lights, but to the structure. And so when the Holy Spirit is truly moving in a person or even in an environment, his goal is not to get eyes on him. His goal is to get eyes on Jesus. I even read one commentator this past week that talked about how the Holy Spirit has has willingly taken on the background role within the Trinity. Mm. And I just thought that that was so interesting that he's fine living in the background. Yeah. And when the Holy Spirit shows up and he is at work, Jesus is front and center. He's working to get eyes on to Christ, not onto himself. And so the same is true in our personal lives. Right. And this is why we need him. Yeah. He is the one who gives us what we need to live lives that make much of Jesus. Yeah. He's that helper. So yeah. if you missed the sermon, just go. I, I said it to somebody yesterday. Man, if people could get this, what Jesus talks about in John 14, it will change everything. Yeah. No. So Go, go back and get caught up if you yeah, missed it. no doubt. I love that. I feel like that's that's a great filter for corporate worship too. Like yeah, is, absolutely. Is, is all of this collectively right. as a body of Christ right. shining a spotlight on Jesus that's or it. something else? And if it's anything else, yep. then obviously there's, there's cause for yeah. concern there. I feel like that's incredibly helpful. Mm. Something else I think is incredibly helpful, but also mind boggling really when you think about it. And you said this in, in the sermon yesterday is that the Holy Spirit is a person. Yeah and not a power. So can you dig into that a little more and just make sense Mm, of that? Yes, I would love to. I think the language that Jesus uses is so significant and really important, and it gets missed by so many people. Mm. He calls the Holy Spirit a he. 
The Holy yeah. Spirit is a he, not an it. Right. And and it's so important to think about the Spirit rightly uh, because he is a person, as I said in the sermon, that we are meant to be in relationship with. The Holy Spirit mm-hmm. is not just some impersonal force that we wield around and use however we want, but he is the third person of the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And just like we're meant to be in relationship with Father and Son, we're meant to be in relationship with the Spirit. Mm. To do that, we have to see him as a person, all right? And and all throughout the scripture, we see his personhood. And so I just pulled some passages that I thought I would read to help people see it. Uh, in Romans 8, 26 through 27, Paul talks about how the Holy Spirit has a mind, okay? Here's what he writes. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what, here it is, knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So this is fascinating. The the Holy Spirit is a rational being. Mm -hmm. He is a thinking being. He is a logical being. He has a mind. And one of the ways he uses his mind is by praying for us. And this is so unbelievable. Bro, have you ever, I mean, have you ever had a moment or even a season where you're just going through it and you didn't even know how to pray? Yeah, absolutely. You ever been there? Of course, yeah. It's like, I, I want to pray and I know I need to pray, but I don't even know how. Like, I don't even have the words to ask right now. If you are listening and that's where you find yourself today, you can rest easy because the Holy Spirit's praying for you. Yeah, that's good. This is so good. Like, he's behind the scenes And the Holy Spirit is going to God the Father and asking for what you need according to God's will for your life. I just find this incredible that that the Spirit is operating on our behalf in that way, that he is thinking for us, uh, rationalizing for us, and praying for us. God, here's what they need. They don't even know how to ask for it, so I'm going to ask on their behalf. It's very personal in that regard. That's incredible comfort, obviously, especially when when you're struggling in that way. Unbelievable, right? Yeah. So good. So good. So he has a mind. Number two, he has emotions. Mm. And we see this in Ephesians 4, verses 30 through 32. Uh, Paul, again, he writes, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. And so that opening statement he makes is so important. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. And what that tells us is that we can actually cause the Holy Spirit pain. Mm. Um, We can cause harm to the Holy Spirit, emotional harm. He is an emotional being. He feels things. And you and I can grieve him. And what's so interesting to me about the text, Paul explains here that the way we grieve him is by disunity and discord and division. Wow. The way that we as believers in Christ grieve the Holy Spirit is through anger and bitterness and we slander people and we're not kind, we're not tenderhearted, we refuse to forgive as Christ forgave us. We're gonna talk a little bit more this upcoming weekend about the new commandment because Jesus revisits it Mm -hmm. in the passage, love one another Mm -hmm. as I have loved you. When we refuse to do that, we, we cause pain to the Holy Spirit that lives in us. Because again, as we talked about it over the weekend, his goal is to give us what we need to obey Jesus. Jesus is the one who gave us the new commandment. When we refuse to walk in his power and obey Jesus in that, it grieves him. It saddens the spirit of God who indwells us because we're acting against what he wants and what he's trying to produce in our lives, you know? Yeah. He has emotions. You want to add something to that? Well, I mean, again, I just think it has such implications for the broader body of Christ. I mean, it yeah. has every implication for us as individuals, but as a church as well. Right. I, I know one of the things that we're passionate about at Cross Point City Church is unity. Yeah. And where there is division, yep. to crush it in, in a God-honoring way, right? right. Through, through difficult conversations sometimes, um, awkward conversations, whatever it might be. But the reality is, is that when the church is unified and the yep. believers are unified, God is glorified yep. through the vehicle of the Spirit. I mean, right, th- this is right. His work. And I just think when you think about that, it's more than just being a nice person. It is. It gives eternal implications into how we live alongside one another. Yeah. It's incredible. You're absolutely right. And and just to kind of keep on that, that topic for a moment, this should serve as motivation for us to pursue unity. Mm. To know, okay, yeah, that person did something that hurt me, But if I live in a state of bitterness, I'm going to hurt the Holy Spirit. Mm. And I don't want to hurt him. 
and I don't want to cause him pain and I don't want to grieve him. So you know what? Despite how I feel, I'm going to just go see if I can make that right because I don't want him to feel that way. That's so good. Right? Yeah. It's so important that we get this. Especially in a world where to bail yeah. is the easiest option. No doubt about it. You just leave. That's right. But at the end of the day, that's that's not honoring to God. Yeah. yeah. Certainly not reflective of the 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 Holy Spirit's heart right. for us. Yeah. Yep. And and that's not what family does. Yeah. So that's powerful. Yeah, man. it's good. It's way good. He has emotions. And then finally, number three, he has a will. Hmm. He has a will. Uh first Corinthians twelve eleven, we see it. This is Paul again. All these are empowered. He's talking about spiritual gifts here, mm-hmm. by the way, in First Corinthians twelve uh, through ch- through chapter fourteen. But he lays out all of these spiritual gifts, and then he says, "All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills." So here's the simple translation: The Holy Spirit decides who gets what gift. Mm. All right, mm-hmm. we don't decide that; He decides it for us. And so I, I find this incredible. We're all working together to fulfill the Great Commission, to make disciples, to baptize people, to teach them how to know and follow Jesus. And and as part of that mission, the Spirit of God gives us spiritual gifts so that we can serve the church and we can serve people. And he decides, like he looks at the bride of Christ, like, all right, I'm gonna give Lane that, I'm gonna give James this, and you know, I'm gonna give these other people these gifts. And so here's what I'd say. If you have an issue with the gift that you've been given, you gotta take that up with the Holy Spirit, Mm -hmm. okay? because he decided that that's what you needed. Mm-hmm. He, he made that decision for you. I would say this is one of the reasons we just need to be okay with whatever gifts we have because the Holy Spirit saw fit to give that to you. And every gift's a good gift. It yeah, doesn't matter amen. what, it doesn't matter if your gift puts you on the front of a platform or if you're behind the scenes somewhere, it doesn't matter. Every gift is a good gift because all gifts come from the Spirit. And he gives gifts according to, to his own choosing, as Paul says it again, apportions to each one individually as he wills. So the point again I'm trying to drive home is this. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is a person and he is a person we are meant to be in relationship with, mm. which I think kind of helps get us into the next question, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, because it's wild to think about that the Holy Spirit, that a person yeah. indwells yep. every single believer. And I right. love how you almost just sat in that truth. Mm-hmm. Pump the pump the church breaks or pump the Christian <laughs> breaks. You know what I'm saying? Because right, we, right, right. I mean, we know the deal, right, dude. We've, yeah. I've got that theology unlocked, bro. Let's move yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. But man, how, how much can those basic elementary mm-hmm. truths when you sit in it, just rock your world yeah. because it changes absolutely That's right. everything. That's right. So anyway, so n- knowing that the Holy Spirit is a person, this person is indwelling us, um, but maybe someone listening right now is just feeling like, man, I do not feel yeah. his presence. Yeah. I don't feel yeah. the Holy Spirit. So yeah. so w- what do we do when, when we can't feel the Holy yeah. Spirit? Yep. All right, here's what I would say right out of the gate. We all need to remember that the goal is not to feel him, mm. The goal is to be in relationship with him, Hmm. okay? Let me just say it again. The goal is not to feel him. The goal is to be in relationship with him. I think this is why people chase experiences, Lane, Hmm. because they forget this. And and I mean like spiritual Mm -hmm. experiences. It's why people go to seven different churches every week because they're after a feeling. I just, Mm -hmm. I wanna go be in that church and at that worship thing and in that Bible study and that whatever. And and I'm not saying everybody who does that is motivated by the wrong thing, but I think there are a lot of people out there that are motivated by the wrong thing. They are chasing a feeling, they are chasing an experience. I was thinking earlier today about how to illustrate this and what came to mind is is the hookup culture Mm -hmm. that exists in our society. And if you think about hookup culture, all it is, it's two people using each other for an experience. Mm-hmm. I don't want to be in relationship with you. I just want to use you to experience wow. pleasure. That's good. And this thought came to mind, might get me in trouble. I'm going to say it anyway. Mm-hmm. The Holy Spirit is not a prostitute. Mm. Okay, we don't get to use him for our own spiritual pleasures, okay? We don't get to be self-centered with the Holy Spirit, and so I'm just gonna say it again, the goal is not to feel him, the goal is to cultivate a relationship with him. And cultivating that relationship, it goes back to what I said over the weekend. Number one, we need an awareness of his presence mm-hmm. in our lives. This is what you were pointing to a minute ago when you said we just, we just sat in it. 
And I think this is the importance of us meditating on truths like this and not just flying by them and not, oh, I know, I know, I know, I know, get on to the next thing, but really just sitting and going, okay, this is the most crazy thing I've ever heard in my life, that the spirit of God lives in me. Mm -hmm. The third person of the Trinity lives in me. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in me. That should put us back in our seats. Mm -hmm. That should leave our jaws on the floor. You know, That should leave us with this great sense of amazement and wonder. At all. It should humble us deeply to know that he is there that he is present, that he's with us, that he is in us. So we gotta start there if we're gonna cultivate this relationship. And then we also need to ask for his help in doing the things that only he can do in our lives. Mm -hmm. We need him to give us that assurance each day that we are sons and daughters of God. We need him to, to give us eyes to see the beauty and the worth of Jesus, to really understand the depths of the gospel, the depths of his sacrifice. Uh, we, we need to give, we need him to give us eyes to see our great need for Jesus. Mm -hmm. We need him to help us see the greatness of God, the glory of God. And I would also say we need to cooperate with him. So it starts with an awareness. He's here, he's in me. And then I need to ask him to do all the things that he's here to do, empower me, bring up all these teachings so I can obey. obey. And then we cooperate with the spirit of God. And this is about, as I said in the sermon, this is about us putting ourselves in the right environments and it's about us practicing the disciplines. And so, I, man, I know, gosh, especially since COVID, and I've heard this from so many of my friends across the country, but you got people who still have not come back to church. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of people where we live have started to downplay the importance of the gathered church, which I think is insane and unbiblical. God has commanded us to gather. Yeah. Ecclesia, it's what it is. It's a gathered people. This is the church. And, and when we gather together, part of us doing that is we're cooperating with the spirit of God. Yeah, We're putting ourselves in an environment with our brothers and sisters in Christ where we are worshiping together, taking part in the sacraments, sitting under the teachings of, of God's word. And in that way, we're putting our lives before the Holy Spirit and we're inviting him to do work in us. Mm. Speak to me, change me conform me more into the image and likeness of Jesus. These environments matter. There's great power in gathering together with other believers in a church gathering, in a group, whatever it may be. Um, but then the disciplines are so important. This is prayer. It's Bible reading. It is community. It's service. It's fasting. It's right. The whole list of things. And so when we cooperate with the Holy Spirit in these ways, here's what happens we begin to feel his presence mm. <laughs> and we begin to operate in his power and we begin to experience his peace. But again, it's not about chasing after those feelings. It's about chasing after him. Yeah, We're not going after experiences. We're just going after him. And the more we get of him, the more we get his presence and his power in our lives. Mm, that's really good. Yeah, You see a great intentionality as any relationship requires, where you have to invest, you have to yeah. seek, you have to desire. I mean, to pursue experience to experience, I mean, it's great when you're on a mountaintop. Problem is, yeah. on this side of eternity, <laughs> we live in a broken world, so That's how right. sustainable is it really? Yeah. There, there are probably a lot more valleys than there are mountaintops, there's, right? There's no doubt. Yeah. And so if, if there can't be an experiential relationship with the Spirit in, in those valleys, mm -hmm. then... yeah then what, we're not gonna truly experience what the Holy Spirit has for us, which, which leads us into to our next question. So for someone who is going through a desert right now, yeah. I mean, they're in, they're in the dark night of the soul. Yep. They, yep. they are not uh, experiencing the Spirit. Like how can, how can mm. you encourage someone yeah. that is in a season like yeah. that? Well, I, I would say first off, you just gotta know that what you're facing is not unique to you, okay? True. Uh, you got to remember that you're not alone in it. I, I was just thinking of biblical examples. I mean, the Israelites spent 40 years wandering in a desert. Indeed. Okay. The people of God are very familiar with desert seasons. I was thinking about Jesus. Where, where was Jesus for 40 days after mm -hmm. his baptism and before he launched his public ministry? Well, he was in the desert. And do you remember who led him there? The spirit of God mm -hmm. took him to the desert so that he could be tempted by the devil and for 40 days and 40 nights, man, he's in the desert, he's fasting, he's being tempted, overcoming those temptations by the power of God's word. But, but I, 
again, want to just say, like, I think as believers, we all go through these seasons. Mm -hmm. Even when I asked that question on on Thursday and Sunday, anybody ever been in a desert season? It's like the whole room's like, oh yeah. yeah, oh yeah, I know what that's like, and and uh, and personally, I know what it's like. I mean, I was I was just thinking of examples from my own life. I, I remember years ago, Lane. Were you with us? I can't remember if you were with us during the next initiative. Oh, yeah. Okay. Very, very first financial initiative we ever did as a church to raise money to purchase the the property that we're now in mm -hmm. in Cartersville, this location, right? And I just remember meeting with some friends who had done similar initiatives before us, pastor friends, and I'm like, all right, what do I need to know? And every single one of them said to me, just get ready for the most intense spiritual warfare you have ever experienced in your life, mm -hmm. okay? And so we start on this, this journey together and nothing was happening. And I'm thinking about what they said and I'm not experiencing that. I'm like, I wonder if I'm doing something wrong or maybe God is just keeping all that off of me. And then bro, I'm telling you out of nowhere, it just hit. Mm -hmm. and, and yes, I would say some of the most intense spiritual warfare I'd ever experienced in my life um, I almost went into a depressed state and I'm not a depressed guy, but that's what it felt like. There was just this heaviness on me. Um, I've even said before, it felt like the devil was trying to kill me, mm. like just take me out, man. Mm. And so I remember um, just walking through all this. It's so strange. It was so weird. But I remember at an 830 gathering, we were still meeting over the House of Rock on Tennessee Street, our old location. We had an 830 gathering at the time. And we're in the middle of this the sermon series that I'm preaching for the next initiative. Mm -hmm. And it's the last place I wanted to be. I didn't want to be in church that morning. I didn't want to preach. And I just remember I'm standing in the front row and as worship's going on, I am praying. And I remember so vividly saying to God, I don't want to be here. I'm about to have to get up there and fake my way through this. And I prayed and said to the Lord, I feel so empty right now. And bro, as clear as day, I just sensed the Lord say back to me in this moment, that's the point of all this. Wow. That's the point. Like this desert season you have been in, that is the point. I have been trying to empty you because there's still too much of you in the way. Mm. And here's what that desert season taught me. That sometimes God will withdraw his presence to crush our self-sufficiency. Mm. Sometimes out of love for us, God will remove his presence to increase our dependency upon him. And so the other thing I would say to you is if you're in a desert season, do not miss the purpose behind it. Like God is, is trying to do something in your life. And I don't know what it is. I don't know what, what he's trying to grow you in, what he's trying to, to remove from you, but you're in that desert for a reason. That's right. And so a few things I would say, just practical advice. Number one, you need to be honest with God about how you're feeling. Um, and God can handle it, by the way. <laughs> yeah. So just go tell him, just be honest. And if you need help being honest, go pray the, or uh, go read the Psalms and pray through those. Yeah, yeah, those are real. I mean, those are very real. Yeah. Like how many times did the psalmist say to God, like, hey, how long are you going to forget me? That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, hey, God, why have you forsaken me? I mean, just all these, yep. these writers, man, just so honest with the Lord. And so express your heart to him. Number two, I would say keep showing up. Mm. And, and by showing up, I mean keep coming to church and keep going to the group and, and keep being involved on the serve team. Just keep showing up. I think, I think when we go through desert seasons, the tendency is to pull away, yeah. right? Um, we feel an absence of God's presence in our lives. And so we start to pull away from his people and that is the wrong move. Okay. Mm -hmm. You need to lean into his people yeah. and you keep showing up. And then I would say thirdly, just keep pursuing his presence mm -hmm. because he is with you. Mm -hmm. Even though you can't sense him or feel him right now, he is closer to you than the skin that you are wearing. He is right there. And what you cannot do is let your subjective feelings dictate your pursuit of his presence. But instead, you have to hold to what is objectively true, that God is omnipresent. He's everywhere at all times. He is present in your life in the midst of what you're facing. And if you will keep pursuing his presence, at some point, breakthrough will come. That's right. It will. I, I think back to that prayer I prayed, right? And I hope this comes as an encouragement to someone. In that moment of prayer, everything changed. Mm. As soon as I prayed, God, I'm empty, and, and God whispered back to me, that's been the point. I, Lane, I kid you not, it was not this gradual climbing out of the darkness, gradual climbing out of the hole. In that moment, Switch. It, it changed. Mm. Everything changed. So I'm telling you, at some point, breakthrough will come. 
So keep pursuing the presence of God. That's that's so good. I mean, it's just we. It's it's a beautiful truth that we have a God that wastes nothing. That's, There's not a season right. in your life that's like, oh man, well, have you just decided different? You know what I mean? <laughs> right, that's right, what right. The struggle is, it's like, yeah. well, do I do this or this? Because God's in this, but not in that. But yep. the reality is, is that, and and it's unfortunate, but still for our good and for God's glory. I mean, pain, pain is what causes growth. Mm. Yeah. Yep. And and waiting. Yeah. Heck, in a desert. Yep. A, a no from God, whatever it might be, that waiting. That's right. Is is some of the moments of, you know, the strongest growth. It yeah. has been for me. Oh, there's Dude, no doubt when, about when, it. When when everything's chugging along, yeah, bro, I'm good. Appreciate yeah. you got you know yep, reading yep, my yep. Bible. You know, be a good be a good boy, whatever that means. <laughs> <laughs> but the reality is, is that it's when it's when those seasons come along, you just become so aware. That's right. You're all I have. That's right. You are all I have. Yep. Whatever the Lord has to do to remind you of that, it's it's a good thing so and a good, good season. That's that's a good word. Uh, you know, you you had talked about yesterday, which I I think is super helpful, and I've I've known that I've done this in my own life. But talking about working Jesus into your debt, which yeah. it, which sounds when you say it, it's like, come on, dude, whatever. But at the end of the day, I believe this is something. It's a problem. I would say that's a 100% problem. It's a problem major at some problem point. in the church. No yeah. doubt. Yeah, oh, yeah, especially yeah. in the church. Yeah. Dude, no doubt. So, how like how can I be sure that I'm obeying Jesus for the right reasons? Yeah, yeah. And and you shared a story yesterday about Peter that I think was helpful <laughs> yeah. and if you could share that again yeah, yeah, that would be great. Yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to. Yeah. Yeah, the story that I shared uh, came from Elizabeth Elliot, unbelievable woman. She was married to Jim Elliot. And he was a missionary. He was a missionary in Ecuador, working to get the gospel to a very remote, unreached people group. Was murdered by these people that he was trying to share Christ with. Well, after his death, Elizabeth Elliot went back and served as a missionary to the very people who murdered her husband. Dude, I had not heard when you said that. Unbelievable. Yesterday. Yeah, yeah. That's that's powerful. And a different a, a different reaction that time. These people came to faith in Christ. Like can you imagine wow. being one of those people and like what are you doing here? We murdered your husband. And she's like I'm here to tell you about the Jesus he came to tell you about. And yeah, unbelievable. Dude. So yeah, there's a lot out there on Jim and Elizabeth Elizabeth Elliot if you want to go look them up or read yeah, some sure. of their writings. But yeah, she tells this fictitious story about Jesus and his disciples and, and Jesus one day comes to his guys and he said, hey, I want you to carry a stone for me. And so Peter being the very calculated man that he was, he, he decides, man, I'm gonna make it easy on myself. And he finds the smallest stone that he can find and he puts it in his pocket and Jesus says, follow me. Mm -hmm. Well, lunchtime rolls around and they all sit down and Jesus says, all right, everybody get out your stones. So they get him out and they put him down and he waves his hand and they all turn into bread and he says, all right, there's your lunch. And Peter's obviously very disappointed because he's like, I'm, I'm eating a Tic Tac for lunch, you know? And, and so lunch was over very quickly. And, and after lunch, Jesus gave the same instruction. I want you to carry a stone for me. Okay, that was the first one. I want you to carry a stone for me. So again, that was it. So Peter this time, he's like, all right, I'm gonna get it right. And goes and finds this small boulder. And it was pretty big, but small enough where we could still carry it. So all day he's carrying it on his back and he's suffering, but all he can think about is dinner and how he's going to feast later that night. Right. And so dinner rolls around and they're by a river and Jesus says, all right, I want you to throw your stones into the river. And so they do. And Jesus says, follow me. And all the disciples start to push back. And, and especially Peter, he's like, hold on. What, well, what about the lunch thing? Are we not doing that again at dinner? And, and Jesus said, well, tell me the instruction I gave. And he said, well, you told us to carry a stone. And Jesus said, yeah, but for who? Mm. And I think a lot of times this is the problem with our obedience mm -hmm. is that we're not obeying for him, we're obeying for us. Mm -hmm. And you know, get back at the heart of the question, how can I be sure that I'm obeying Jesus for the right reasons? That that's where I would just ask you the question, well, who are you obeying for? Are you obeying his commandments for him and for his glory or are you obeying for you? Like, is, is it about making much of him or is it just, no, nah, I'm just trying to get something from him. And, and so you have to get down into the depths of your motivation and you really have to give a close look at what's going on there. And the questions that I wrote down were these, uh, two questions. Am I obeying Jesus because I've already received or am I obeying Jesus because there's something I wanna receive? Mm -hmm. So you have to take a, a long, hard look at your motivation for obedience and that's what you ask. Am I doing this because I've already received 
or am I doing this because there's something I want to receive? The idea of working God into our debt is this. Well, if I obey enough, God's going to owe me. Mm -hmm. Well, if I do all the things that God wants me to do, God's going to owe me. And I would just remind all of us today, God owes us nothing. That's right. Nothing. And if we really got what God owed us, we'd all be yeah, in hell right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. You do not want what he owes you, yeah. my friend. Uh, but the beauty of the gospel is that God has given us everything we don't deserve in and through the person and work of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. right? So through Jesus, we have got the opposite now of what we are owed, um, that God has given grace and mercy, right? Mercy, he's, he's withheld judgment. Christ took that on our behalf. Grace, he gives us everything we don't deserve, everything we haven't earned. And that has to be the motivating factor in our obedience. Mm -hmm. Like when we, when we stop and look and go, man, I'm a rebel, I'm a sinner, I've, I've offended God, I've ignored God and the world that he made. What I deserve from God is wrath and judgment and hell for all of eternity. But God, out of his great love, yeah. gave me mercy and he's made me alive together with Jesus Christ and he seated me in heavenly places with him. And, and I have been saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. It's not a result of works, it's a result of what he's done on my behalf that has to be the motivating factor, right? Obedience is a response to what we have already received. We don't obey to get from God. We obey because we've already been given everything that we could have never earned on our own, right? Mm -hmm. And so obedience is a loving response to the love we've received through and, and in the person and work of Jesus Christ. So I just go back to the question, who's your obedience for? Mm. Who's your obedience for? And if you are the listener who would be honest enough to say today, well, right now it's for me, you need to repent of that. You need to confess your sin and repent. Mm -hmm. And you need to come to God and you need to ask the Holy Spirit to give you vision today. Mm. Help me to see my need and help me to see the beauty of Christ and help me to see the depths of his sacrifice. And, and I would say as well, you just need to ask the Spirit of God to stir your affections for Jesus, mm -hmm. uh, to, to take that, that self-centeredness out of you and to replace it with deeper affections for Jesus so that you can obey him out of true desire. Yeah, that's so good. I mean, at the end of the day, God wants our hearts. That's it. That's it. He wants our that's hearts. Right. You look at who Jesus locked up with. Yeah. Primarily, it was the religious leaders, and they were doing all the stuff. Right. On the outside, dude, yep. they were checking every single box, yeah. and yet their hearts could not have been farther from the Lord. Yeah. And I just feel like that's a beautiful reminder that that it is our motivation. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing that matters. That's right. And uh, anything else is gonna is gonna fall short. That's right. Well, the the fact that God has saved us out of death and hell should be enough. That's exactly right. Like even if God never did anything else for you over the course of your entire life, mm -hmm. the fact that he would do that for you has to be enough for you to give your entire life to him, right? Absolutely. And I think the mistake that too many people make is like, oh, yeah, yeah, thanks for the salvation thing, but God, what I really want from you is, and man, that's such a dangerous place to be in, you know? It's the real danger even bleeds out from our culture into the church is just, um, it's a lack of contentment. It's yeah. always more, yeah. something different. You know, and, and at the end of the day, that is incredibly dangerous. Mm -hmm. And again, talking to the Holy Spirit, hey, show me this, prove right. me. And again, to your point, if Jesus did nothing more than lay his life down on the cross, yep. pay for sins that we couldn't, it still should motivate us every second of our life yep. to to be all about his, his kingdom. Right. And yet sometimes it can get sideways and become uh, about yeah, things about that ours, it shouldn't be. About our kingdoms, That's right? That's exactly right. Yep, yep. Yeah, man, that's that's so good. You know, yesterday you had mentioned something um, about the the peace that passes all understanding. Yeah. And just just for for someone, and again, I've, I've I've shared this multiple times, but seriously, someone who who wrestles with with anxiety, mm -hmm. wrestles with with fear, and even yeah. the spirit of fear, which I even appreciated you kind of touching on that yeah, yesterday. Yeah. Um, I know. I know it's this piece that I want to experience at, at all points. And I know it's this piece that we all want to experience. Yeah. So um, like, how do we get that? Yep. Especially for, for many of uh, our listeners right now that, that everything is going wrong. Right. Right. Like they're in the darkest of valleys. So what is, what does that look like? Yeah. Well, that, that piece that you're asking about, um, you know, we, we talked yesterday about Shalom, right? This is that piece. And the idea of shalom is wholeness or completeness, you know, that 
that something that is complex, made up of many different pieces, is being brought back into that state, a state of completeness or wholeness. And the first part of the question, the answer I would give is we, we have to know that peace comes from Christ and him alone. Mm. That's what he says in the text that we read. Peace I give you, my peace I leave with you, okay? Uh, I love the title that Isaiah gives him in Isaiah 9, 6, this prophecy about Christ recorded 700 years before his birth, that he would enter the world as the prince of peace. Mm. Think about that. Like he, he, is, he is the Lord over peace. He is, he's the ruler over peace. And, and that means a couple things that I touched on in the sermon. I want to hit him again. Number one, that he came to give us peace with God. This yeah. is first and foremost. And this is the good news of the gospel that I hit on just a moment ago, that as sinful people, apart from Christ, we're enemies of God. We are under the wrath of God. What we deserve is to be separated from God for all of eternity. And because we are our enemies, we can't make peace with God on our own. It's not like we can just wake up and decide one day, well, right. I'll, I'll put myself right with God. Well, good luck, man. That doesn't work, okay? And so Jesus, the Prince of Peace, came to do that for us. And it's what he accomplished by his life, death, and his resurrection. I love Colossians 1.20 that says that he made peace by the blood of his yeah. cross. So think about that, man. Yeah. That Jesus went to the cross, shed his blood, became our sin, took the wrath that we deserved so that we could be forgiven and accepted by the God that, that we have rebelled against. Like this is what he did, laid down his life so that enemies could become friends. Mm. It's absolutely amazing, yeah. peace with God. Uh, he also though left us this piece that you're talking about. I, I gave it the title, the peace of God. Mm -hmm. And this is that supernatural peace that surpasses all understanding. And as I said over the weekend, if you've ever seen it, you, you know you've seen it. Mm -hmm because this is the person whose life has fallen apart and they're like, oh, I'm at perfect peace. You ever seen a person I like have, that? I have. Yeah? Yeah, it's one of the things that I love so much about pastoral ministry is the mutual edification and just blessing where I, I get to be able to sit with someone and something they're going through and yeah. what they're sharing. Right. And all, all it is is them just putting up a mirror to the reality of what what the, the Lord's grace is giving yep. them in a season. And it, it's, mm -hmm. it is powerful. Oh, it's unreal, isn't it? It is. It is yeah. insanely powerful. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, I've seen it. Like you, you know, you you watch someone walk through death or tragedy mm -hmm. or cancer diagnosis or whatever, and man, you know they're suffering, and and you see it, and in the midst of grief and pain and suffering, there is this peace that that just characterizes them, and this comes from the Lord Himself. Mm -hmm. It is that unexplainable supernatural peace that no one can really make sense of. And, and I'll get into the practical side of the question, how do we get it? Well, number one, you walk in obedience to Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. This is one of the things that, that he talks about in John 14, that if we love him and if we obey him, the Father loves us and they will come and make their home with us. Mm -hmm. And this is not about, as I said in the sermon, earning anything. It's about us experiencing something. Right. And when we love Christ and obey his commandments, we get to experience the love of the Father and we get to encounter the all-encompassing presence of God. And consequently, the Holy Spirit imparts peace into our lives, okay? The presence of God brings about peace. And so you have to walk in relationship with Christ if you want to really experience what we're talking mm -hmm. about but then secondly, I would say you need to ask for it. You need to ask for this peace, especially in times of, of pain or trouble. And I think it's really important too, as we ask for it, to understand what it is we're asking for. Because shalom, this, this idea of completeness or wholeness, it's not necessarily the absence of conflict, right? but it is completeness in the presence of conflict. Mm. Does that make sense what and I'm saying? Totally. It's it's that the Lord is going to do something internally that even if the external That's right. circumstance, even if everything doesn't just go away, That's right. that the Lord is going to give you what you need right there yep. in, in right. the valley. And isn't that the mistake that we often make? That's right. Uh, I, I make think, my make my situation. Yeah, go away. that's it, man. Sure. That's the default, I think, in prayer when we're suffering. Mm. Change this. Everything that's going on outside of me, God, change mm. this. Asking for shalom is like, no, 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 change this. That's what's going good, on man. inside of yeah, me? Yeah, that's good. I, I need that joy and that contentment that can only come from you, regardless of what's going on out there. This is shalom, okay? Mm. And Philippians four verses four through seven came to mind. 
And I think this will be helpful and, and uh, it really, again, gets at the heart of the question. This is Paul writing, and he was not having a good day. This brother's in prison, okay? He's writing this from a jail cell. Yep. And he says, rejoice in the Lord always. I don't know about you, that might not be what I would be writing if I was in prison, okay? Yep. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Here it is. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So let me just run through this quickly. If you want this peace that we're talking about, it starts with rejoicing, okay? Mm. You rejoice, not in your circumstances, all right? This is not a call to act like everything's okay when everything's not okay, all right? We don't rejoice in our circumstances, but we do rejoice in the Lord, in his person, in his work, in his character. And if you will just set your gaze on the Lord, you have plenty of reasons to rejoice. And so you rejoice in him. The second thing he says is be reasonable because the Lord is at hand. And so this is about you and I living in light of our future hope. Again, I think when you're in a desert season or when, when God feels far away or when life is really difficult, it is so easy to lose sight of our future hope mm. and to know that one day true shalom will exist in our world. Like, do the world so jacked up and we know things aren't right. You don't even have to be a Christian to know that That's things right. aren't right in the world, but to know that one day Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace will return and set all things right. That's what we cling to. Mm. One day we will live in perfect shalom. And so this call to be reasonable is about living in light of that. Hey man, don't, don't act like that's not your future. You, you need to, to think rationally and to live logically here in light of what you know awaits you. He keeps going and he says, don't worry. Hmm. That's easier said than done, isn't it? <laughs> yes, yes, sir. Yes, and so uh, I just wanna put everybody at ease though because Paul is not saying that we should not feel worried. All right, the truth is we all worry at times. Paul is telling us instead what to do when we worry. All right. So instead of just living in that, you need to take all of those worries to the Lord. You need to cast all of your cares and all of your anxieties on him. He actually invites you to do that. And then he says, we need to pray with thanksgiving. Hmm. And this is important, man, because I think again, when life is hard, oh, we're quick to pray, but I don't know that we do that thanksgiving part so well. Yeah. I think when we bring our problems to the Lord, it's really easy to leave aside all of the blessings and I'm just saying, if you want to experience this peace, when you pray, you need to also spend some time thanking God mm. for the good things in your yeah. life. And let me just say this, going back to the conversation a few minutes ago, if you're like, there's not a single good thing I can think of. Did Christ save you out of death and hell? Right, right. Thank him for that. Right. Just, just thank him for that. If everything else is hard, at least thank him for giving his life for you so that you could be put back in right relationship with God for all of eternity. You got something to be thankful for, all right? Yeah. Pray with thanksgiving, and then you bring your requests. So be thankful, and then ask God for what you need. I need your help. I need your power. Right. I need courage. I need faith. I, whatever it is, I need healing, you know? And then Paul says the result of all of that, approaching God in this way, is peace. Supernatural peace that surpasses all understanding and it will actually guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. I just love that imagery of, of that peace guarding us, you know, mm. from the evils of this world, the attacks of the enemy, our own wrong thinking. And I'll just add this and then Lane, you can chime in and we'll wrap this thing up. I would also say, don't think that doing this once is enough. Yeah, that's right. Because there's probably somebody listening, oh, I've done that before. Yeah, you need to do it again and do it again and do it again and do it again. And like in certain seasons, this is something that you do every day and all throughout the day. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what being dependent on the Lord is about. It's not about, well, I asked once. Right, exactly. <laughs> well, keep going and keep asking and keep throwing yourself upon his grace and mercy and let him show up for you. And so if you need to stop right now after you're listening to this podcast and do this, do it. Yeah. And then just keep asking. Yeah. Yeah. As you're talking about that, obviously we have uh, a world. I mean, individually we wrestle with it to a certain extent, but I mean, you look at the statistics, the really hard, mm -hmm. sad statistics yep. of just 
the level of anxiety and the lack of peace that yeah. exists that, that that even can lead to things like suicide. Yeah. I mean, wh- whatever. I mean, multiple implications. Yeah. And it's just having to ask ourselves, even as believers, where am I going for peace? Right. Because, dude, peace and escaping, yeah, yep. those are two different things. There's no doubt. You know what I mean? Sometimes it's like, oh, you know, that kind of feels like peace. Let's go, right? Right, right, right. I mean, right. obviously, you can go to the substance, yep. the pill, yep. the bottle. Yep. At the end of the day, it, it's only going to make you yeah. more and more broken, more and more anxious. That's right. Until you go to the one person that yep. can actually give you a legitimate piece. It's interesting, Paul here, and 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 who even knows what what Paul? I mean, hit his mind. Yeah. I mean, dude, what could he be facing? Death. Yeah, that's right. Getting his head cut off, yeah, who knows? Crucifix, upside down. I yeah, mean, dude, Roman right. torture, brutal. And yet, in the midst of it, he's not saying, "Hey, could you could you break down these bars? Could right, you, like, right, right. Could you take off these chains? Yeah. He's actually encouraging the others to experience a peace that surpasses all understanding. It's it's right. a peace that he's experiencing right. in that moment. Dude, that brings a new level it does. of just like, it does. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Paul wasn't writing that on his best day. He wasn't sitting on, a, exactly right. on a beach somewhere, pina colada in hand, you know, sun shining. Yep. No, 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 that was not the scene at all. And uh, to know that he wrote that when he wrote it and from where he wrote it. Yeah, this, this brother was speaking from a deep place of experience and knowledge. Yeah. And... Yeah, if if we will do what he has instructed us to do, we'll experience what he experienced. I yeah. believe. And and sometimes it's in that that darkest valley yeah. where you experience the deepest level of peace. Right. Yep. It's incredible. So all right, well, I feel like that's a good place to to put a pen in it. I've loved being back. Man. Hey, it's been good having you back. We should do this again sometime soon. Okay, let's yeah. do it, man. Okay, awesome. Well, listen, thank you all for listening. And as always, we want you to know that we love you. We are here for you, and we'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Pursuit with James Griffin. Be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you'll never miss an episode. If you have questions about the message, the scriptures, or faith in general, you can send them to us by texting the word QUESTION to the number 22722. For more information about our church or this podcast, please visit crosspointcity.com or follow us online at Crosspoint City. If you found value in this podcast, we would love it if you took time to like it and share it with a friend. Doing that will help more people know and follow Jesus. And finally, we want to invite you to join us each week for one of our gatherings in person or live on YouTube. We hope to see you soon.